G'day folks, in this week's video we'll be harvesting those water chestnuts from the aquaponics and I'll give you a bit of a heads up on how easy they are to grow. Just quickly before we get started I wanted to let you know that I've uploaded another PDF download to our aquaponics beginners guide. For you folks who have already purchased it, thank you very much for the support folks. Uh, it's looking at how bell siphons are made and it goes through step by step with a couple of different alternate methods that weren't really mentioned in the video module of the beginner's guide. So check that out if you're interested on um, learning a little bit more. And for you folks who haven't um, seen the guide already, I will leave a link above on the little card system there and also one down in the description. And you can hop on over to the website and have a little bit of a sneak peek of what the guide is all about. So that's enough about that. Now on to the water chestnuts. So to begin with, these fellas here were planted out from corms that were saved from last year's soil harvest. They were harvested around about August of 2021, which is towards the end of our winter. Uh, we have very mild winters here in Southeast Queensland. So these ones had already started to sprout by the time they were being harvested. I popped two corms into this little dual root zone grow bed behind me here, made out of a bathtub. And from there, they pretty much will took off. Generally speaking, when we do plant them out, we only put one to two corms into a 50 or 60 litre container. And from there, they just take over the whole container. Now, water chestnuts are a sedge plant. That's why we always grow them in flooded containers and bathtubs. And that's what makes aquaponics such a great way to grow these because there's always water available to the plants. So that's enough rambling on about that. Uh, we'll get these guys out and give you a bit of a look at the yield. So the first thing we have to do is turn off the water into the bed and also cap the outflow. So none of the muck we disturb in the bottom goes down into the sump tank. The second thing we need to do is get the um, ginger out of here. It's got a bit of um, media stuck around the base there. Oh, a little compost worm as well. So we'll pop him back in the bed and we'll just set this to one side. So I'm not going to be very delicate about this. I'm basically just going to grab these reeds and pull out the water chestnuts. There will be a lot of clay in them as well. I'm not too worried about that. That'll all come out when I hose out the, um, the root sections you know, over the top of the wheelbarrow. So we'll give them a brief little shake now. And away they go into my tote. And you might be able to see there are a load of water chestnuts down here that have just broken off those reeds. So these guys here, same treatment. They'll just be thrown straight into the uh, tote. Uh, this section over here. There we go. I'm gonna give these guys a bit of a shake. Oh, look at all that. That's not too bad at all. That's if you can make them out in amongst all that muck there. And a couple left over this side here. Now there's going to be loads of these water chestnuts left in the bed here for me to forage out. There's one without any skin on it. And the big danger is accidentally leaving one of the really small ones in here and then taking off again. Now, case in point, last year's soil harvest, once I'd finished, I popped all the soil back into the tote itself. And within a week or two, we saw a single little shoot come up and that single shoot has turned into all this growth here. So we're actually expecting a half decent harvest from the soil tote as well. Now, one of the reasons I don't want any water chestnuts left in here is because this last crop blocked up the flow down this side of the grow bed. And there's only a little bit coming through over here. Just the massive roots just totally retarded the water flow. Yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to have them in such a small, narrow bed. And if I pop them in a pouch, they can also live in soil. And yeah, we might get a different yield again, growing in a mix of aquaponic nutrient and soil as well. I'll keep digging through here a little while longer. Then we'll go and clean out what I've already harvested. So this is the tote of water chestnuts and it's pretty easy to clean them out. All I'm going to do is a clump at a time in my compost sieve here and just see if we can get all the uh, muck and the clay balls away from the corms. This might take a while, so I won't put you through it, folks. All these little bits here, I'm actually sticking to one side because there might be little bits of clay stuck in the ends there. Oh, 
Now this is the last clump to clean off before I get to all the spare ones that came out in the clay. Now these ones here are all the ones that were in the clay and I'm sure there will be even more. Picked up a couple of hitchhikers with all those chestnuts so these compost worms can go back into the aquaponics I think to uh, keep breaking down all that organic matter. Come here fella. So there we go folks. That's the majority of the yield. The harvest is done, but before I give you gander, I thought I'd just um, run through what's going on with this bed here. There will be more potato pouches going in here, but I think I will remove all this clay and refresh it. Uh, this clay will just end up in another bed down the line. The reason being is that there is a load of solids that has accumulated in this bed, which, you know, is just something that's going to happen. Load of roots in here. There was the nasturtium, the sweet potato, and also the fine solids that make it through the filters. I mean, backyard aquaponics filter systems aren't 100%, so some small fines make it through. The compost worms can't look after all this solids, so yeah, I think I might just clean it out because I don't really want to um, flood water into here and send all this back into the rest of the aquaponics system. I might be able to drain it out and put it in the mineralizer though, so that might be something I do. So these three little baby water chestnuts are another reason I want to clean the clay out. They are roughly the same size as bits of clay within the system, and I can't really screen them out. So what I'm thinking of doing is just popping this out on the ground on top of some shade cloth. That way any compost worms in here can escape down into the ground. And we'll start off with some fresh clay uh, that I have um, set aside. And then we'll put the uh, potato pouches, the new potato pouches in this bathtub bed. So that won't be happening until next week. And when I pull it out, I think I'll also be finding more water chestnuts. There's another one, there's another small one. And we might come across one or two large ones as well as loads of roots. So that's something I'll have to keep an eye out on as well. I um, don't think there'll be too many more large ones though. But anyway, that's enough rabbiting on about that. We'll go check out the harvest. Rightio, these are the three different roughly graded sizes of water chestnuts. And I thought we'd start with the uh, smallest first. Just tip them out on this tray. These are the ones, and there's many more left in the bed that could be mistaken for clay or are just a little bit too small and fiddly to peel. So we're going to try something different with these ones rather than throwing them out. I'm going to give them a rough clean up with a uh, paring knife, give them a bit of a scrub, and then we're going to just blanch them, parboil them, and then see what they taste like with the skins on. And thank you very much, Shane, for that tip. Uh, rather than waste them, uh, we thought we'd have a crack at, you know, um, seeing if they do taste okay with the skin on. So that's what we'll be doing with the majority of these. I'll probably keep three or four aside and then they can go out to help start next year's crop as well. Just a quick heads up too, I can plant one of these small little water chestnuts here and still end up with those really large corms. So that's why I'd like to save these guys here. You don't need to save the large ones to grow large ones the next season. So um, yeah, I hope that helps anyone out there who wants to have a crack at growing some. Now I'll just pop these back in here and we'll have a look at the next size. These ones here, could easily be peeled a little bit fiddly. Some of the smaller ones might be a little bit um, difficult with my large fingers, but yeah, they, these guys here are all viable as well. You just don't get much out of them after you um, run the paring knife around them. But again, uh, before we try and peel any, we are going to have a crack at uh, using that parboil method and see how they taste uh, before we go to all that effort. Normally we just take a little paring knife and just try and take off as little amount of skin as possible. And then I just store them in a bowl of water in the fridge if we're going to use them fairly fast. Or we just chop them up and throw them into containers in the freezer. And when you bring them out and toss them in a meal, they're just as crunchy as ever. So these ones here, I'd say, you know, ones like this probably went into the wrong basket. But they're very easily peelable. As you can see, there's quite a few meals in there. I mean, we're probably only in a sand choy bowl. We'd probably only use about that many uh, once we peel them. So we've probably got about oh, half a dozen to eight or so meals worth of water chestnuts in here because they don't make out the bulk of most of the meals they're used in. They're pretty much all just added for the crunch. So now onto this last lot. And I must say, I'm pretty chuffed with some of the size of these guys. I think they're actually some of the largest water chestnuts we've grown. So I'm really, really keen to see how the soil went this season. And if we don't, don't get large ones like this, I think I might try just growing in the aquaponics from now on, keeping in mind that I need to keep them segregated from other plants because they uh, tend to take over a bit. But I mean, that's absolutely awesome. Uh, 
for a sand chai bowl for the family, just the three of us, we'd probably only use about four or five of these. In a curry, I might add a little bit more because we then tend to make um, more curry than we need as we like to have it as leftovers. So I'd probably use that amount. So yeah, while it's not gonna see us through a whole year's worth of curries or sand chai bao, it is nice to grow some of these tasty little treats yourself. There's one last look at the water chestnuts. And if you wanna stick around, I'll uh, pull a couple of the soil ones out just to give you a bit of a sneak peek. Uh, quickly, I would like to thank everyone who is supporting us on the different supporter sites. Thank you very much, folks. Really do appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who likes to um, also hang around and have a bit of a chat in the comments section after they finish watching the video. But I'll pretty much all leave it there. I do hope that your aquaponics and your gardens are booming, and I'll catch you next video. Cheers, all. Take it easy. So here we go, folks. Just going to dig on in and see what we can unearth. There's a lot of roots in here, so it may be a little bit difficult just to pull a couple out. So I've just pulled out this little corner here, folks, and that's what I've got so far, but I'm sure I've missed one or two. This looks like a very promising harvest as well. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see a short video on harvesting the soil chestnuts. Cheers all, happy growing.